So we're starting our third set of notes in unit four on sensation and perception. And in this set of notes, we're gonna focus on audition, which is our sense of hearing. So this is a bit of a review from our vision notes about um, color or light waves. The light waves are very similar to sound waves. Okay, so the frequency of a wave, which we talked about with vision, the dimension of frequency determined by wavelength of sound. So how many waves do you have in a given time or how far apart are each peak in the waves would indicate frequency and that gives you pitch. Okay, so the higher the frequency, the higher pitch sound, the lower the frequency, the lower pitch the sound. So humans can hear sounds at frequencies from about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz and we hear sounds best at about three to 4,000. So um, this is actually where human speech is centered. It's kind of interesting. Intensity of the sound wave is loudness, okay? So the loudness of a wave is determined by the wave's amplitude, which is the height. So the point from the, the peak of the wave to the bottom of the wave. Um, so amount of energy in a wave determined by amplitude or height of each wave um, and it, that relates to perceived soundness, and soundness is measured in decibels. Okay, so how many decibels is it would determine how loud it is. So the loudness of a sound, a sewing machine being 70 decibels, uh, a strike of lightning, which would be thunder, right, um, is 120 decibels. So a busy street is at 80, okay, and so anything above that would mean that prolonged exposure to 85 decibels or above produces hearing loss. So 140 would be like rock band, a very amplified at close range. Um, a jet plane at about 500 feet, those are all very loud noises, right? Zero being the threshold of hearing, a whisper being at 20 decibels. So this is the ear, right? This is the ear and you gotta know all parts just like you gotta know all parts of the eye. So this part that you see, which is like the funnel, it very much looks like a funnel, right? Makes sense because it's funneling in noise. So the part that you pierce, like if you were to pierce your cartilage, right? All of that part, it collects the sound is called the pinna. So sound waves are funneled in there and they go through the auditory canal, which is this canal, it's like a tube, right? The first part that it hits is the ear drum, a tympanic membrane, okay, and that, that will vibrate just as a drum would. Um, the parts of the middle ear, okay, so all of that from the pin to the ear to the auditory canal really is the outer ear. The middle ear is bones of the middle ear, which include the hammer, the stirrup, and the anvil. You should write those down. Hammer, stirrup, like to stir and up, and anvil, A-N-V-I-L. And then you've got the semicircular canals, okay? Semicircular canals is actually what controls our vestibular sense, okay? Make sure that you write that down. Our semi semicircular canals and our inner ear control our uh, vestibular sense. The oval window, which is actually where the stirrup attaches to the cochlea, so that's like where the middle ear attaches to the inner ear with the cochlea. Okay, so the, the cochlea is actually where the basilar membrane is in all of the hair cells or hair follicles. And those hair cells, make sure you write this down, the hair cells, if those are damaged, that is irreversible damage, and that is noise-induced hearing loss. Damage to the hair cells, which is just damage to ears over time due to exposure to sound, like me talking to you right now is causing damage to your hair cells at a very, very minuscule rate, right? but louder noises will cause that damage. And we'll talk more about noise induced hearing loss, but the hair cells is actually what transduces the sound wave into a neural message. So if you're ever asked where's transduction in the ear, it's in the hair cells. So they transduce or translate into a neural message that the auditory nerve then carries to the thalamus. The cochlea, so this is kind of a zoomed in version picture of the cochlea. It's the coiled bony fluid filled tube in the inner ear that transduces sound vibrations to the auditory system. Okay, so if it were kind of uncoiled here, it's got the basilar membrane with the protruding hair cells in it, okay? Um, so it then just transduces to the thalamus and the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe. All right, we've got theories of how we hear pitch. We have the frequency theory, which states that the rate 
of nerve impulses traveling up the auditory nerve matches the frequency of a tone or sound, thus enabling us to sense pitch. Okay, so the frequency of the wave continues up the auditory nerve, allowing us to perceive pitch. That's one theory. The other theory is place theory, which suggests that sound frequencies, the frequency of the wave, stimulates the basilar membrane at a specific place. Okay, so it simulates a specific place on the basilar membrane resulting in perceived pitch. So if this is zoomed in and uncoil the basilar membrane, it'll hit right there, depending on its pitch, which then allows us to perceive that certain pitch. The localization of sounds. Okay, we have two ears on our head, right? Um, sounds that reach one ear faster than the other, although it's just a split second, it helps us to localize, to find the location of a sound. Anybody have dogs at home, right? If your dog ever hears something and goes hmm, with their head, which is like super cute, especially when they're puppies, when they hear a funny noise and they turn their little heads like, whoa, what was that? Well, they are trying to localize a sound there. They just don't understand what they heard. So they're putting one ear closer, right? And shielding one ear to see if they can see where it's coming from and therefore see what it is. We do the same thing. We know to turn our heads to the right if something was hit our right ear because it hit our, our left ear next. We know what the localization, the location of the sound is over there. So hearing loss, we all are going to experience this no matter what. The older we get, we tend to lose the ability to detect high frequency, high frequency or pitch, high pitch sounds, right? So you can actually hear higher pitch sounds than I can. I can actually hear higher pitch sounds than people older than me simply because of time, simply because of exposure to hearing things. I have been hearing things longer than you because I've been alive longer than you. Therefore, my hair cells have more damage. So this is what we call noise-induced hearing loss as I talked about earlier in the video. Noise-induced hearing loss being damage to the hair cells in the ear which means if we have that noise-induced hearing loss, which we all get with age and time, we lose the ability to hear higher and higher pitch sounds. So in 10 years, even in a year, even in five years, I'm going to not be able to hear as much high pitch sound as I can right now, and the same is true for you. So let's talk about not just hearing loss, but hearing deficits and that there's damage um, outside of just that that's accumulated over time, even though we are gonna kind of talk about that here. So why do we lose the ability to detect upper frequency as we age? It's due to the everyday sounds, like we just talked about, right? So generally any sound enough to produce um, ringing of the ear causes some damage, and that's 85 decibels or higher. So over the years, that damage accumulates and is referred to as noise-induced hearing loss. So the high intensity sounds can actually tear off the hair cells in the inner ear, causing that noise-induced hearing loss. And here are some pictures on the left of healthy three rows of hair cells here of the inner, um, of the inner ear, and then these are the damaged, damaged hair cells because of the loudness. Hearing loss, again, this is even more severe damage to the ear. We have two different types, and yes, you have to know the difference between these. Conduction deafness, is hearing loss caused by damage to the mechanical system um, that conducts sound waves to the cochlea. So it's not damage to the cochlea, it's damage before that. It's damage to the middle ear. Okay, you wanna write that down about conduction deafness. It's damage to the middle ear. And it may be corrected with surgery or even hearing aids. Okay, so this one can be corrected with a hearing aid. Sensory neural deafness. Okay, it's sensory, it's the sensation of audition and it's neural. It's damage to more than just the mechanical system. Hearing loss caused by damage to the cochlea's receptor cells or to the auditory nerve. This is also called nerve deafness. This is a permanent condition. There is no correcting this like you can correct conduction deafness with a hearing aid. You can, however, have something that's called a cochlear implant. It's an implant on the cochlea in your ear, hence its name, um, and there's a lot of different parts to it as laid out in this slide, but the, th the implant does not restore normal hearing. Instead, it can give someone who is deaf a useful representation of sounds in the environment and help him or her to understand speech, but it does not correct the problem. Like a hearing aid would connect, correct conduction deafness, the cochlear implant does not connect sensory neural deafness. 
And here's just some more um, pictures. It's rather pricey um, and it's a little controversial as well because people of the deaf community don't necessarily see themselves as handicapped or in a deficit. They can do everything that everyone else can except here. So why do they have to have this abrasive, very expensive surgery um, to be quote normal or to be part of the normal world, right? So there is some controversy in the deaf community um, surrounding the cochlear implant.